said, the book is called How to Read London, and it's a chronological journey through pretty much a thousand years of architecture in London, but distilled down to about 115 buildings, which is quite hard work. The Barbican does actually feature in the book, so we're going to talk a little bit about the Barbican. But before we do, just have a look at the exhibition that's on behind you there in the curve. As the name suggests, it is actually a curve, and I thought it would be useful just to start off with that in mind. I mentioned earlier the curve gallery at the bottom, and that's actually the basement of the building that we're standing in or under now, which is Frobisher Crescent. So in terms of that curve that's in the title, I thought it would be quite useful to see the top and the bottom of the curve. So here we have a series of panels by an artist called Dorothy Annan that were recovered from Fleet House, which was a big telephone exchange that was built on Farringdon Road in the 1950s. The client of the new building on the site, which is Goldman Sachs, the big American bank, agreed to fund the removal and the restoration and the reemplacement of these uh, panels here. So behind me we have a building that's now called City Point and it looks quite modern and quite up to date but actually at its core there's a very late 1960s building called Britannic House. In common with a lot of those 1960s buildings after about 30 years it was deemed to be a little bit out of date and there was a plan for the Catalan architect Santiago Calatrava to build a completely new building there. Uh, on the other hand, we've got something that's very new here. When the Barbican was built, the very first building to be built was called Milton Court, and it's exactly on that site there. And it was reached by a bridge that went from here across to the building. And effectively, there was a very interesting deal done with the Heron Group, which is a big commercial developer. And the Guildhall School of Music and Drama got that building, which gives the school much greater and newer facilities. And the Heron Group got a nice luxury residential tower. So over here we have Milton Gate, which is something that kind of snuck under the radar a little bit towards the back end of the 80s, early 90s. Apparently this was one of the first buildings with what we call a triple glazed facade, so you're familiar with double glazing probably from home. What's particularly also interesting is that the strange modelling of it apparently derives from Scottish sources. Apparently he was quite a fan of baronial castles. Almost all of the buildings along the street on both the city side and the Islington side have been replaced at least once since the war. But one that's left is the one behind me, which is Longbow House. Uh, but what I think's of real note is the fact that you've got that fabulous arch of relief sculpture. And it's interesting because if you think back to the Annan murals that I showed you in the Barbican Centre, you've got a good example here of figurative art uh, being included in the building. We're going to continue on to Finsbury Square, but as we do, do take a look back at the east elevation of this building, because you'll see there's some rather nice little basket-shaped balconies that are on the side. We have over here uh, 10 Finsbury Square, designed by Shepherd Robson in 2015. Probably the newest building here, um, to an extent. Quite interesting because, as with a lot of post-war buildings, after the war, artificial lighting wasn't actually as good as it is um, now and so you get a lot of quite narrow floor plate offices and this is a really good example because although the building is new the site dates from the 1950s so this is 30 Finsbury Square and um, this is a very different beast altogether designed by Eric Parry who again is quite a well-regarded architect but has also got some very interesting changes of style the aim here was to provide column free office spaces which is what everyone wants nowadays and he did it in a very unusual way all of the uh, stone panels that you see on the outside are actually load-bearing. So instead of having uh, lots of columns on the inside, all the structural load is borne around the outside, and that allows you to take most of the columns out from the inside. So this was essentially Royal London House, built for the Royal London Insurance Company. You can see that it is edging into that quite baroque, quite grand Edwardian kind of style. And in the book, we'll touch on a couple of those. Then in the 1920s, they extended uh, and they brought in Belcher's partner, Joas, uh, and they did this fantastic central section with this terrific tower. It's one, two, and three Finsbury Avenue Square, which was one of the biggest developments in the city. And a very enterprising British developer called Stuart Lipton had been looking at America and thought there was a market in London for really high quality, purpose built, speculative office blocks. He used British architects, Arabs, but he used American methodology. So this is Finsbury Avenue Square, which again, you kind of have to imagine this 25 years ago before that was there, and indeed before much of Broadgate was there. It's important to realize that almost all of the buildings we're looking at today, anything that's more than about 20 years old, will have been modified at some point, and obviously I'm pointing out a lot of that. And there was a plan to preserve the two buildings that they knocked down to build that, because the buildings were only 25 years old. Um, that failed, I, I had a small part in that. This whole idea, this tension between no, listing, preservation and what a building is used for 
it, it's really becoming an issue, certainly for commercial office blocks, which it never used to be. No one ever used to think twice about them, to be honest. Finsbury Circus has an interesting history in itself. It's the biggest open space in the city, even though the middle bit is now taken up by Crossrail, unfortunately. Um, it's about 100 years newer in terms of its built architecture than Finsbury Square. It was laid out in the early 1800s, but it was laid out by the corporation and it was laid out again as a residential area. So if we look here on the right, we can see here um, Park House, which is probably the most recent one. It was originally built in 1923, and most of what you see here is actually original from that period. And I think what's interesting is as we step around this part of the square, you see effectively a period building that's been updated. The yellow one that you can just about see as we get to it, you'll see is a very mod, well, very 1980s building, which is still pretty much as it is. And then we get a couple more examples as we go around. The London Wall was quite an ancient street, but after the war, this plan to build motorways through London meant that the city wanted their bit or was going to get their bit. So all of this part of London Wall was going to be remodeled into effectively a motorway, which is why it ended up looking like the way it did. So the most obvious example here is Ball Place, which is a foster building. Again, on this side, you've got this rather remarkable curve, which was a way of, as they say, mediating the change of height between the really tall bit on the west side and the slightly smaller buildings that you see here on Ball Day. In terms of the architecture, okay, it's nearly finished now, so you can kind of see what it looks like. Um, I'm not sure whether the white is very highly polished concrete or metal, it's kind of hard to tell in this light. Um, the black though, which I hadn't appreciated, looks pretty much like ceramic to me, so I think that's quite interesting. I mentioned Eric Parry when we were in Finsbury Square, um, the building with the slightly old staggered load-bearing columns. Uh, this is also a Parry building, but again, very, very different. Um, not only is it a tower block, uh, but it's also clad in stainless steel rather than uh, concrete and stone. So it's quite interesting to see how he does change his style. Roman House, just over here, which again was one of the earlier post-war buildings, finished in 57. Um, it's a really nice little example of a post-war office block, but at least it was until they changed it in the last couple of years into more posh flats. So they've replaced all the windows, pushed the window line out a bit um, to give you a little bit more space. So that's kind of it. I hope that's given you some flavour of a number of generations of buildings um, in London. We're obviously slightly restricted as to what you can cover in 90 minutes, but it's surprising actually how much there is around. So we've certainly done um, a good 100, 120 years or so. The other 800 years, we'll have to get the book and work out ourselves. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who would you like it, mate? Uh, Susan. Uh, S-U-S-A-N. Yeah.